My name is Tiffany Leung. I'm the scientific editorial director for JMIR Publications. Why do we care about using reporting guidelines? Um, there is evidence to suggest that for authors, the use of reporting guidelines can be favorable for a variety of different reasons, uh, as listed here. Some of the evidence-based reasons can include, for example, adherence to reporting guidelines um, can also be correlated uh, with citation frequency. Adherence to reporting guidelines by authors when reporting on their scientific work can also result in uh, publication in higher impact factor journals. And finally, that the reviewer ratings of, of manuscripts that adhere to reporting guidelines also may be correlated with more favorable editorial decisions. So when I say reviewer, that's for peer reviewer ratings. Um, naturally, there are many study designs, as you can see on the right side here. Many study designs can apply to your studies that you're doing, of course, uh, around the world. Uh, we're seeing a lot of papers uh, being submitted where uh, the authors were not reporting a lot of the details about their models. And what that has results in is uh, many uh, iterations uh, with, the, uh, with the reviewers. Um, so the reviewers, basically the first round will be, you're missing all of this, these details, and it'll go back and another round of revisions for the authors to provide those details. Uh, and then in the second round, the review actually starts when all the details are available. So you essentially waste one round of reviews, which can be a month, two months, depending on the cycle. Um, so in order to accelerate the process, it's much easier for the authors to, uh, to include all the details a priori in their papers to accelerate the review cycles. And sometimes the reviewers can be very critical if you miss some information, so it may actually have, have an impact on the, uh, on the final decision um, uh, as well. We have more and more data that is being published, and uh, we have, while we have more and more of this data, it also makes it more difficult to find what really matters. So um, there's this abundance of data and it's, it's challenging to, to extract uh, the valuable insights that we need to you know, improve future processes and so on. And this is where the I checked guidelines come in um, to really help us remove this metaphorical blindfold and see the full picture to help stakeholders better understand and learn from um, each other's experience in this rapidly evolving landscape. And the lesson here is very clear, you know. When different stakeholders share a standardized uh, way to report, it can lead to significant improvements uh, across the board. Um, so on the left you can see the, the QR code to bring you to the guidelines and then I uh, also want to mention that uh, in Jamie Medical Informatics there is a specific section that is called implementation reports where you can um, submit implementation reports using the guidelines and while we uh, have a very broad scope for implementation reports so um, you can submit almost anything. I also want to bring you to the attention that we just launched a call for papers that focuses really on the aspect of industry-driven innovations. I'm Gunther Eisenbach. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Medical Internet Research and also founder of um, a couple of other uh, digital health journals. So I'm doing this work for 25 years now, believe it or not. My point here is that I think in, in digital health, e-health, medical informatics, however you want to call it, um, reproducibility is often the elephant in the room um, because people report interventions, apps, um, software, uh, the effect of, of these interventions without uh, sufficient details for anybody to reproduce or falsify these results. And so at, the, at a minimum, we need a really good description of what has been done. And this is exactly what, what these guidelines, actually all of these guidelines want to address. So the consort statement has like a single item. This is item number five in the, in the generic consort statement that says describe your intervention. And there's no more information. So that expansion of the consort guideline really focuses on what should be under item five, like what, is, what are the sub-items that you should describe about the intervention um, when you do a randomized evaluation of a e-health intervention. We also 
ask some additional questions and for example uh, questions about the app or intervention and also things like when did you fill in this uh, questionnaire. So ideally people would do this before they submit, that's the red one. The majority of authors said in the, in the questionnaire as well that the consort eHealth improved their paper. I actually think that AI can help with improving manuscripts or like perhaps pre-populating this kind of checklist. And we have like a pretty unique data set of with 2,500 trials with all the language in these different sub-items. So AI should be trainable to actually rec recognize certain phrases in a manuscript and pre-populate uh, forms. In my view, I mean, there are a couple of potential like, applications. First of all, as I mentioned, there are 250 reporting guidelines out there, so I think AI could perhaps help to have a look at the paper and say, okay, these are the reporting guidelines you should follow. Um, there's actually also kind of an algorithm on the Equator Network website that's kind of, is kind of perhaps the starting point of such a decision-making uh, tool. Um, second of all, AI could make sure that those items, the sub-items are properly reported and then flag it to the editor or reviewer if, if there are questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, my third point is perhaps a little bit more provocative. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the future of publishing and it just strikes me that we continue to write for human readers and not for machines <laughs> and especially for RCTs. Um, a point could be made that perhaps like the, the report for the human reader should be kind of the secondary output and the, the primary output should be something that's machine readable so that we can do things like systematic reviews in an automated fashion. So a little bit provo provocative view of the future would be perhaps things like the consort eHealth form could be just the starting point for people to enter the results and, and characteristics of the intervention, et cetera, in a, in a very structured format. And then LLM could just you know, create a human readable report from that, but, but, but the, core, the core output here is kind of a semantically tacked like, paper that can also be read and digested by machines to like, quickly aggregate the evidence in certain fields. So that's kind of my, my vision for the future of publishing, actually. I, I might just add a, a little extra response also, is that in the one sli introductory slide that I had brought up, I had a little picture in the corner of some kitchen tools in the corner, um, trying to make a metaphor to that Reporting guidelines also can be useful for especially early career researchers too as a sort of ingredient list, let's say, for uh, you know how to plan your study even before you start doing it. Which one is the right study design and how do you make sure that you're going to be able to address all the components? That can be very useful, I think, especially for folks who you know, are getting into research or starting off um, to help guide them. Um, and then also, yeah, as Gunther indicated too, in the publishing industry, there's uh, a lot of actually vendors and even startups that are looking into using various methods to be able to analyze text and potentially evaluate for specific content um, that is there. For example, having an ethics consideration statement, data availability statement, code availability, and various other aspects that could also be relevant for certain types of studies.